Well, welcome everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Asad Madni from uh, the University of Southern California. Um, he'll be presenting updates on his research task, uh, WRT 1019, Adaptive Cyberphysical Human uh, Systems Testbed. And with that, I turn it over to you, Doctor. Thank you, thank you, Tyler, and thank you, Todd. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my, presenta my presentation today is on our circ sponsored research that is concerned with developing an adaptive cyber-physical human system testbed to support model-based systems engineering. The target application domain for the testbed is multi-UAV operations and missions such as maintaining physical security of high-value assets and search and rescue. This problem domain is of interest within the CERC universities as well as in the Department of Defense. The transition sites for the research prototypes are two CERC universities. University of Virginia and University of Alabama Huntsville, as well as the Aerospace Corporation. I will begin by presenting the motivation for this research. I will then present the progress we have made to date. I'll specifically, I'll present an overview of the testbed, followed by the key elements of the overall approach. I will then describe the current capabilities of the prototype testbed using an illustrative problem scenario. And I will go into quite a bit of detail in terms of the software that we created that reflects the level of depth and breadth that we can have in our scenarios. This scenario is one of DOD relevance and interest. It has to do with the protection, the physical security of a landed KC-130 aircraft. And then I'll conclude with uh, the benefits of having a, a model-based system engineering testbed for experimentation. Next. In addition to me, our project includes Professor Dan Urban as co-principal investigator. Dan is also the chair of the USC's Astronautical Engineering Department in the Viterbi School of Engineering. I should probably say a few words about our department because we've made some pretty impressive news in the last couple of years. Our rocket propulsion lab is run by an undergraduate student team. In 2019, this team broke the world record by becoming the first team to design, build, and successfully launch a rocket that crossed the Kármán line which is a recognized boundary between Earth and space, and that exists at 330,000 feet above sea level. In this lab, we see a prototypical, a prototypical group with an entrepreneurial mindset and one that reflects innovation, teamwork, and as important, leadership. In addition to that lab, we have our distributed autonomy and intelligence system laboratory that I lead along with Professor Dan Urban. We conduct research in this lab that supports CERC research, National Science Foundation research and model-based system engineering, and research sponsored by General Motors and Boeing and other companies. This testbed is being put together by researchers from this laboratory, and they include Edwin Ordokhanian, who's a graduate research assistant, a PhD candidate who's supposed to graduate in 2021. The other researcher on the project, a graduate research assistant, is Parisa Puya and she's a PhD student. The overall project manager for the, this effort and all the other research efforts is Dr. Aisha Madney. Let's go to the next. So very succinctly, the project objective is to develop a cyber physical human system testbed for developing, integrating, experimenting with, and sharing new methods, models, and tools for engineering autonomous systems. In short, this is a model-based system engineering testbed. Next. The motivation for this uh, testbed came from meetings that I had with the CERC executive director and the government. And it's very simply this. We want to enable CERC researchers working in autonomous systems to focus on research and experimentation and not get bogged down with implementation details. We want to provide them with a convenient platform to showcase their research products on demand, both to internal and government customers. We want to have the ability to facilitate comparison, integration, testing of virtual system models and digital twins within an, a, a structured environment. We want to simplify interoperability among models that is produced by CERC researchers. And of course, we want to facilitate sharing of model-based system engineering artifacts as well as lessons learned. So 
Underfitting the whole chest bed is a chest bed ontology. And what I'm going to share with you is the chest bed ontology that we have at this point. It's fully extensible. So as we discover new elements that need to be added, we go ahead and add that along with their relationship with the existing elements there. The chest bed ontology at the moment has the following concepts. Scenario, which is the specification of a mission that provides the contextual backdrop for experiments that you do using the test bed. We have the concept of a world, which is simply a geospatial region which supports the experiments. We have the concept of a vehicle, which is where the work is focused on. In this particular case, the vehicle that we are focused on is a quadcopter, which is a type of unmanned aerial vehicle, but a rather small one. We have the concept of an agent, which is an active element which may or may not be a vehicle. We have the concept of experiment, which is a scientific procedure undertaken to test a hypothesis or to demonstrate a particular capability. We have the concept of a laboratory, which are the elements that participate in an experiment communicating with each other over Wi-Fi. Next. We have the concept of a project, and this is where we scope the project and where we convey what the benefits are that you're looking out of the, from the project. We have the concept of a scenario builder, and this is the software that facilitates the creation and modification of scenarios. Then we have a very, very important concept called the dashboard, which is a customizable and smart visualization software package for monitoring and control that allows the users to import scenarios from third party uh, as well. We have a concept of a standard vehicle. And in this case, the standard vehicle is a physical quadcopter model. And then what we do is we pr provide predefined scenarios, which is a starter kit for researchers to quickly get started with the test bed so that they're, they have a running start on any problem that they're working on. We have a concept of data collector, which is software to collect simulated execution data. And then of course, we have a concept of a digital twin, which is a software replica of a physical system that reflects both the operational and maintenance history of the physical system. Let's go on to the next. The core technologies that underlie the testbed are a domain ontology, which basically drives three things. The scenario builder in terms of what semantics it needs to have. The dashboard displays in terms of what are the core elements that need to be displayed on the dashboard to make sure that we have uh, total situation awareness for the human in the loop. And then it also drives the operational simulation where we test drive various concepts. The second key piece is a scenario builder, which is an end user oriented graphical modeling and scripting capability. We can do both graphical modeling to create scenarios as well as use scripting for more sophisticated work. We have a customizable dashboard, which is context sensitive and it's based on the ontology elements I described earlier. We have system modeling tools like system L, decision tree, trees, hidden Markov models, and partially observable Markov decision processes. And then we have an off-the-shelf drone kit platform with visualization facilities. We employ quadcopter hardware, as well as a virtual quadcopter model. And then we have an intelligent layer that sits on top of that, which is quadcopter planning and decision-making model, which sits on top of the quadcopter controller. Here you see the testbed architecture of the prototype testbed. The key components are system modeling tools, a user interface for scenario building, a scenario driven dashboard, and report generation capability. We have a private cloud to protect, rec provide requisite protection of model-based system engineering assets, and a repository to persistently store MBSC knowledge assets. And finally, we have a simulation engine to support the model-based system engineering experimentation. Next. Uh, can you lift this up a little bit? Because uh, I think it's getting cut off at the bottom. Okay. Yeah, just, yeah, no, no, you can, you can expand it. It's fine. It's fine. Go back to the previous one. It didn't cut off. Okay, that's fine. Here you see the test bed hardware. To the left is a quadcopter. We have two different sizes of quadcopters. One kind of a medium sized one and one a small one. In the middle is the quadcopter controller, which has three programmable modes that can be defined by the user. For example, hold hover, or do perform fully automated, automated flight, or hold al altitude only. 
to the right of the of the controller is the dashboard that comes with the Ardu Pilot, again, a commercial package. This dashboard is used to calibrate the flight computer, calibrate the remote controller, and watch the current status of the quadcopter. Not to be confused with the dashboard, which we are using for mission execution and operation. Next. Here are some of the test bed capabilities. We have the ability to model scenarios, script them, and import them from external sources. We have a context-aware monitoring visualization control of multi-UAV systems. We have the ability to create a digital twin and use that in simulation. We have the ability to control the physical vehicle and the virtual model using identical commands. We have the ability to collect data for post hoc analysis. And we maintain an execution trace, which is a full audit trail of all that has gone on in terms of the scenario. So you can go back and look. It turns out that this particular feature of maintaining the audit trail became very, very important for us because the it became a, a debugging aid. And we, in fact, use that extensively, the dashboard extensively for as a debugging tool, which was not our original intent, but we found it to be quite useful in that regard. Next. So I'll take a couple of words about the scenario builder. It facilitates the development of new scenarios and modification of existing scenarios that you have in your library. It consists of two capabilities, a scripting capability, which allows the scenarios to be described in a simple text-based language. It also provides a graphical layout capability, which allows users to rapidly sketch simple scenarios with a mouse. The guiding principle for this scenario was with the words of Alan Kay, who said, easy things should be easy. And that's basically the graphical mapping and modeling capability. He also went on to say, and hard things should be possible. And that's our scripting capability. Move on to the next. So we, I spoke about a standard vehicle as being one of the key elements of the ontology. So what we have in this regard is a standard physical quadcopter model. It is an engineering refinement of our current model that we had created on earlier RTs sponsored by CERC. The key difference between the one we have now and before was we have a clean design which supports ease of assembly and crashworthiness, ability to crash without damage. The software employs a discoverability component. It automates vehicle network communication, and it provides a plug and play capability so that manual setup of vehicle IP addresses is no longer needed. Next. So now this is a smart dashboard. This is one of the heart of the total capability of the testbed because it makes visible all that is going on when scenario is executing and it has the following key capabilities at the moment. It is scenario driven, which means you can import different kinds of scenario and initialize the dashboard with that. It is context sensitive in the sense that the context presents only those elements that are relevant or pertinent to that particular moment in time for maximizing situation of awareness and reducing clutter. And the contextual terms that we use again here are from the domain ontology. The layout is customizable, and to customize that, you have both graphical modeling and scripting options here. The default displays that we offer at the moment are a plan or a mission view of the world, which shows the different vehicles in their various states. We also have camera views from the difficult, both uh, building mounted and vehicle mounted. And then we have vehicle state indicators that tell you the state of the vehicle. And then we have resource status indicator that tells you, like, for example, what is the status of your battery? Is it fully charged? Is, is, is it discharged? Because that tells you whether you can perform a full mission, uh, kind of a, a reduced mission, or not at all. We have the ability to, to have the human intervene during the execution of the simulation to retest the vehicles or reallocate resources based on what the human perceives is going on in the operation environment. We have the ability to uh, ca capture and replay the entire audit trail. Uh, both you see that captured in real time and you can replay it later. And you see the vehicle state uh, changes for every single vehicle that's in, participating in that scenario. 
We have experiment controls, such as start spot, stop of the experiment. So everything, the world and everything that's going on in that is under user control. Next. So this is the smart dashboard and here you see a particular view. So this is kind of the layout. The problem domain being addressed again, as I noted, is the perimeter security of a stationary aircraft after it has landed. The top left window presents the mission view. The top right window presents the selected camera view. Below the mission view to the left is the mission log that presents all state changes for all the vehicles involved in the mission. Below that are st status indicators of the battery level for each of the three vehicles involved in the mission. The location, velocity, and altitude of each vehicle is shown right below the battery level indicators. To the right of the mission log are the controls which can be human in the loop or automated. Once the simulation starts executing, the coverage achieved appears below the controls window. To the right of the controls window are the camera views for each of the three quadcopter vehicles and from the building mounted video cameras. Next. So with the test bed, we provide also a documentation which consists of a starter kit of predefined scenarios. These are things that are meant to simplify usage of the test bed by users. So users can just start with these scenarios right out of the box in a simulation environment and later in the physical laboratory. We also provide multi-vehicle multi control algorithms and we provide more than one. We have a rule-based deterministic algorithm and we also have a partially observable markup decision process model-based probabilistic algorithm. Uh, <clears throat> and then finally we have the scenarios and control algorithm that are also documented. And two things we provide here in this case, how the scenarios and algorithms can be created and how they can be uh, used and modified. Next. Now we get into the aircraft perimeter security scenario. And this is a real world scenario that I have been working on with the US Air Force for some time. And uh, it was one of great interest to both the Air Force and the Department of Defense. So I proposed this uh, as the basis for demonstrating our capabilities and it worked out really well for us. And we have demonstrated and presented this at several search reviews and in the Pentagon and things like that. And people seem to like the, the richness of the scenario. So I'll go into some depth uh, with this scenario and particularly the software that we have created. So in this scenario, a C-130 military transport aircraft is parked on a landing strip in the vicinity of a military outpost comprising several buildings. With security of the aircraft being of paramount concern, the perimeter of the aircraft is secured by two kinds of surveillance assets, fixed location, building mounted cameras, and downward facing cameras mounted on airborne unmanned aerial vehicles. Because this is a relatively small perimeter, the UAVs that we have employed in this case our quadcopters. So our goal here is to maintain video coverage of aircraft perimeter despite disruptions. And when I say disruptions, I mean things like you lose a drone or you lose a, a building camera, so you have lost coverage as a result of that. And so the question is, what actions do you take to restore that coverage? And those actions could be simple or compound. And the actions could be simple things like uh, reposition current flying drone or launch a reserve drone or maybe do things in combination. The system status is depicted by color-coded indicators. Green means that you have full perimeter coverage. You're in a good situation. Yellow means that you're responding to a disruption. Red means that you lack the capability to restore coverage. And if you're in the red state, the system will alert the commander to intervene. Next, you agree? So here is a pictorial depiction of the aircraft perimeter security problem with the C-130 on a landing strip. And you, as you can see, there are multiple uh, UAV cameras uh, in the air uh, providing perimeter protection to the C-130 aircraft. Next. Next. Yeah. Here you see, no, no, go back please. Back up one. Go back one more. Yeah, stay, stay there, stay there. 
What's going on? Go back, forward, please, forward. Next. Please go to the next. And go on to the next. Stay there. Here you see the vehicle with the three UAVs in, and you see their color code in pink that shows the trajectory that they're following with respect to uh, maintaining coverage of the aircraft. Next. Okay, here is the scenario simulator. So the mission view that you see here is the plan view of the C-130 aircraft perimeter and the surroundings. In this view to the left, you see two buildings are visible. On each building is a video camera and that is mounted. Um, and with views of the stationary aircraft from different directions, you see that there are two different directions. The cameras are pointing and they're all collecting uh, data on the the location and the uh, perimeter of the aircraft. The shadows that you see on the ground emanating from those cameras indicate the intersection of the viewing volume of each camera with the ground. In this particular case, three quadcopters have been assigned to the surveillance mission and they're ready to launch, but they have not been launched yet. So these quadcopters can be seen on the ground at the bottom center of the mission view. There are five cameras in all three that are mounted on the quadcopters. We call them QC1, QC2, and QC3. You see that at the right-hand bottom. And there are two building-mounted cameras, which are BC1 and BC2. The views from each of the five cameras are shown at the lower right. The quadcopter cameras do not show anything at this point because the quadcopters are still on the ground awaiting launch. The control section in the middle, or rather in the bottom center of the simulator allows manual control of the quadcopters and of the azimuth and elevation of the building cameras. So we are, the human is able to control both these. The selected camera view shows the field of view for the camera corresponding to the currently selected control tab, which in this case happens to be BC1. We chose this scenario because it affords the opportunity to demonstrate three key concepts, adaptive coverage, human in the loop decision making, and collaboration among, among multiple agents. And the problem that we have here is to control the collection assets, which are the UAVs and the fixed cameras in such a way that you optimize the multi-sensor coverage of the aircraft perimeter, despite experiencing disruptions. Next. Here you see the dashboard showing the coverage area. The quadcopters have not been launched yet. So the coverage that you see is solely due to the building mounted cameras. Next. Here you see one of the quadcopters is in the air, it's flying. Note that the control automatic fitness function in the, in the center is checked so that the quadcopter is moving in a manner to maximize the fitness function. And this is where the fitness function algorithm comes in, into play. And as you all know, a fitness function is a particular type of objective function that is used to summarize in a single figure of merit how close you are in your design solution to achieving the set of aims that you have. And fitness functions have been popularly used in genetic programming and genetic algorithms to guide simulations toward optimal design solutions. So the coverage area here shows the coverage due to the quadcopter. The messages that you see in the mission log show the quadcopter search for arriving at an optimal location while through the search process. Next. Here you see the optimal location for a single quadcopter, which is in the air. The quadcopter happens to have found the optimal position. Note that the quadcopter has climbed to 60 meters and yawed minus 20 degrees to fit in the field of view with the air. So this view is an orthographic projection of the nadir pointed view that you saw earlier. The orthographic projection is a means of representing 3D objects in two dimensions. It is a form of parallel projection in which all the projection lines are orthogonal to the projection plane, 
resulting in every plane of the scene appearing in affine transformation on the viewing surface. Next. This figure now showed the terrain view for the search and rescue mission, which is currently under development. The location and the determination of altitude for two quadcopter, quadcopters is enhanced by the location indicators that you see here. So in every case, we are creating different perspectives and different visualizations to enhance situation awareness. So these are different views that jointly contribute to that enhancing situation awareness. Let's go on to the next. So we talked about digital twin and we of course have a digital twin of our quadcopter that we have created in our laboratory. But here's a digital twin of our entire laboratory. This is where we do experimentation with quadcopters and 116 robot cars, 116 scale. It has been difficult to use the lab these days because of the social distancing protocols going with the pandemic. But we're getting it done with difficulty. So people like uh, uh, Parisa and uh, Edwin, they spend quite a bit of time there uh, in this laboratory working on different aspects of this testbed. Go on to the next. As I noted earlier, our transition targets are two universities and an FFRDC. The universities are University of Virginia and University of Huntsville, Alabama. The FFRDC is the Aerospace Corporation. Next, please. And now we come to one of the benefits and payoffs of this testbed. And there are multiple and several. I'll go into each one of them. First and foremost, it gives us easy entry into the field. You can start using the system with a zero dollar investment by installing open source software and running the pre-built simulation scenarios. In fact, you don't even have to use any hardware. You can just use this directly on your computers. And then you also have high volume, inexpensive consumer commercial off-the-shelf hardware that we use, which again keeps the cost quite low. The second key benefit is that everything is easy to assemble and replicate. We provide a library of standard hardware and components. And we have identical software interface uh, protocols for virtual and physical system control. We have reduced risk of experimentation. The experimental work can be initiated using known, proven designs without the need to design new vehicles and become essentially expert makers. And as importantly, if not more, we offload researchers from getting bogged down with implementation details by providing libraries of models, connectors, and, and an infrastructure that facilitates interoperability. Next. Then from the point of view of using the test bed for analysis purposes, we provide a very easy comparison interface. You have, you have effective visuals that are multi-perspective and multi-level, and you're able to compare research results for different models, different algorithms, even possibly uh, for, uh, done by different researchers. We have the ability to enable best practices through rapid dissemination of extensions that we make to our models and our scenarios. And we can distribute that to the system engineering community, specifically CERC community. And of course, we have the ability to rapidly realize new integrated capabilities by virtue of having this testbed with all its capabilities. We're able to do cost-effective experimentation. We can test models of vehicles and sensors and algorithms, for example, optimization algorithms or machine learning algorithms, and do that in simulation. We can achieve significant time and cost savings by having this freely available backbone and primary tools for creating experimental environments distributed to various researchers in the different universities working in this particular area. And as importantly, if not uh, more, which is one of the most important things for CERT, is we can give on-demand demonstrations to internal and external customers. And by external customers, I mean people in the government, people in industry and such. Next. So let's provide a quick uh, summary. CERT researchers working on model-based system engineering for unmanned aerial vehicles will benefit from this testbed. They'll be able to define scenarios and model systems using a variety of modeling techniques. They'll be able to conduct what-if experimentation and collect data from the experiments. They'll be able to generate MBSC artifacts and share them with other researchers. They'll be able to continuously improve their system models and refinement of MBSC processes by running simulations, experiments, and using machine learning and analytics to upgrade these various models. 
The prototype that we have built thus far established the feasibility of the testbed concept. We are able to see quite easy end user scenario building. We have a smart dashboard for scenario simulation execution, visualization, monitoring, and control. We are able to create with digital twins and insert them uh, into the simulation, and in so doing, be able to enhance our verification and validation capability. We can instrument both onboard and environmental sensors and collect data from them. And we have a library of models and connectors that facilitates uh, experimental setup and integration. And we believe that the testbed will enable rapid cost-effective experimentation and information sharing within the CERC UAV community. Next. Next, yeah, okay, good. So we have several publications uh, that we have published on the testbed. Uh, most recently, the IEEE System Man and Cybernetics Conference that was held virtually October 10th to 14th. We have another one that we just did at NDIA just a few days ago. And then we have another one coming up uh, in March, which is at the IEEE Aerospace Conference that typically is held in Big Sky, Montana, but this time it's going to be a virtual event. Next. Here are some of the relevant journal publications that uh, support our research and we publish in a variety of venues. We have articles in INCOSI Insight. We have articles in the System Engineering, INCOSI System Engineering Journal. We have articles in the System Journal of MDPI. We have articles on digital twin technology and its integration with model-based system engineering also published there. We also have an article on economic analysis of model-based system engineering that I published with a PhD student. That's also in the systems journal. And with that, that brings my talk to a close. And I'm here to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's, uh, my, that's my bio sketch. OK. okay. So you have that. All right. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the talk there. I don't see any questions yet in the chat. Maybe some will come in. But uh, maybe to start, I can ask, um, have you uh, been able to, have you, have, have you demonstrated to any external um, people and, what, and, and what, have, what have their reactions been? Oh, we have demonstrated this to uh, external people and in fact transitioned a rudimentary version of this to the Aerospace Corporation. And the response has been uh, very favorable. Also, we have demonstrated this in the, I've demonstrated this with Edwin, uh, a PhD candidate uh, in my department at the Pentagon, and it was very well received there as well. In fact, that research, that presentation led to the creation of this particular RT. So to me, it's the, the integration of all those different components that, that really stands out. Is that what stands out to those, uh, those folks as well? Yes, the, the, the integration of the different components and the ease of use, mm. the ability you're not staring at a blank screen, that we provide starter kits for people to get going. So the threat factor goes away. Uh, I've been building tools for the last 35, 40 years. And I've, if you can provide a starter kit, whether it be a process model, a product model, a work breakdown structure, people can work with that and get to a conclusion very quickly. But if, you ha if they have to stare at a blank screen, it's pretty daunting. And thank you for those questions, Tyler. Good questions. Mm 